Okay, welcome back to part two of my interview with uh, Michael Thompson, former leader of the Aryan Brotherhood. Uh, in part one, you know, I introduced you to Mike. Um, it's funny, some of the comments I'm already getting uh, are interesting. You know, people are, I think the thing that's most intimidating for people that aren't used to um, studying this information is the calmness and the intelligence of you know former you know former leader like uh, Mike Thompson is uh, that's that's the big thing people people misunderstand the intelligence of a lot of these predators and in uh, these gangs and Mike can speak very eloquently about that and uh, he does so in there now we set up last time kind of his history how he transferred you know into the difference between Violence says he knew it as a civilian and then what happened what it became and how it became currency Once you're in the system and that's the reason that that we really want to look at this information because People that use violence as currency like the Aryan Brotherhood black gorilla family and again, it's not it's not Regulated to one prison gang. That's the other thing. It's just uh, it's just we happen to be talking to Mike and that's where he went he went with the Aryan Brotherhood um, again, this isn't about prison gangs this isn't about getting in depth if you were looking for me to you know talk about the criminal aspects of it more than i am or the history or the racism or any of that i think if anything it's probably uh, caused a, a couple of people to question the idea everybody assumed it was just a completely racist organization and yet you have one of the founding members is half jewish you have somebody like michael thompson who is you know native american you have people basically from different walks of life. And so what does that tell you? It tells you these organizations were all about power, um, especially during the time when Michael was involved with them. Um, now we're going to go into more in-depth, you know, dealing with close quarters combat. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting. I, it, it's very funny for me because oftentimes I will – give very inconvenient truths to people and they're just not willing to hear them um they want to believe that whatever their training dictum was that that's the way to handle certain situations like multiple attackers how to deal with somebody with a knife what to do when you don't have a tool how do you fight effectively and i think michael handles a lot of that in a very direct manner and very useful manner so there's a lot to pull apart from these interviews if you've not seen the first part of this interview, you need to go back and watch it because uh, it really, it's, it's taking all of this information in. Um, also, I'll say this up front, Michael's organization, uh, Live, Lead, and Prosper, um, highly, highly suggest that you at least check them out. There's a donation um, option there. And I really, I really like the organization. I really like what he and his wife are doing. His wife's very, uh, very accomplished in prison reform, um, highly trained in it. And I hope to maybe have her in a future interview and talking about this because I, again, um, I've studied this for quite some time and recidivism is just, it's just rampant and programs like this, even if they don't only change one person, that's one less predator that'll be on the street. That's one less person that'll be disrupting society. And a lot of times it's just giving people skill sets they didn't have growing up. There's, there's a lot of things behind it. This is not being coddling. This is not excusing behavior. This is not, you know, uh, ignoring some of the horrible acts of violence a lot of criminals have done. But the reality is they're going to be back out in our streets. And how do we want them to interact with the public? And if we give them zero training, zero options, zero ability to integrate back in, they're going to go back to their old ways and people are going to get hurt. So it's just something else to think about. So please check that out. Michael's doing some really good work. Again, he's been out of the, the gang for quite some time. And he talks about that. But violence followed him well after that. And to this day, he still has a target on his back. So without further ado, here's part two of my interview with Michael Thompson. Uh, attempting to educate them about the realities of these things. Um, and to my way of thinking, that's why you and I are having this conversation. 
Well, is to yeah, provide Michael, that, the, that the other thing that you, you touched on, which I think is so critical, is the fact, and this is what I, I educated myself on by, you know, mm -hmm. doing more study and, and hearing mm -hmm. interviews. I didn't get to talk to anybody directly, and I'm, I'm actually glad the, the, I took the advice of the, uh, of the corrections people on that. Um, because, yeah, there's ramifications to that, too. You, you, they, yes. Counterintelligence doesn't stop at law enforcement aid. It no. can, you can bring you, you can bring that on yourself also if you if you're in there but what was interesting was listening to the individuals um you know from various groups you know various high level groups it, the fantasy that i think the general public would like to think is yeah it's a bunch of knuckle draggers who you don't have to worry about they're just a bunch of like idiots no they're highly intelligent people right. i mean and, and strategies used albeit you know for criminal purposes that are highly effective, mm -hmm. like, like you can get a whole business right. education on, on running things. And the other thing that's really interesting to me is what these organizations are able to accomplish without, um, without the, uh, what, what you would think would have to be essential, you know, the, the logistics or the, or the technology, the, the mm -hmm. administrative back, you guys are, were very, you know, streamlined, um, to the point to where I read a, I read a book by, uh, English PhD who studied the American prison systems. And he was very, he was, it was a very good book. Yeah. He, his, uh, his takeaway on the gangs that we're talking about is that the uh, people want to believe the, 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 they want to believe it's chaotic. They want to believe it's irrational. When he said, it's probably one of the most hyper rational societies he's ever studied. Meaning it's very, you know, it, the, the problem that most people have is, and I know I keep coming back to this theme, the reason mm -hmm. it's hard for people to digest, for, for citizens to digest, and then people that haven't, you know, been in the criminal uh, world, is the fact that they're okay when you look at like a big corporation like Apple, Google, or something where they have market share, they have something like that. It's all mm -hmm. backed up on, you know, either technology that they, they control, or they have a large cash reserve or something like that. Mm -hmm here it's all predicated on the successful threat of you know backed up by by specific acts to prove that they're capable of doing it but it's mm -hmm. it's that threat of violence mm -hmm. that is just yes. so hard for people to digest that don't understand the world and mm -hmm. you know I, I think what's probably more intimidating for everybody is the level of intelligence that i've encountered um hearing these individuals speak and how they laid things out mm -hmm. and how they did things it, it rivals um it, it rivals some of the top corporate execs that I know CEOs people like that as far as what they're able to do and I'm not complimenting it like I'm glorifying I'm just saying no, it's a reality no. the reality is no. these are very intelligent individuals who happen yeah. to use it for criminal you know applications or what I've also seen is probably individuals that got into the system early mm -hmm. educated themselves mm -hmm. to a level that's highly impressive you know when, yeah. when, you, when, you, when you think about what they're doing and dangerous you yeah, know, I, I think that's the other thing that, that people don't understand. I mean, when yeah. people say to me all the time, they'll say, oh, you know, geez, you're in the special operations world, you work, you have all these people in the world, you know, that you've known, you know, all these top fighters, all these other people, mm -hmm. they say, you know, who, you know, who, you know, who do you think that they'll name some well known fighter or some well known mm -hmm. trainer or something? You know, do you think this individual is that or anything? And I said, No, I said, the, the people that would keep me up at night and the people that I would absolutely worry about, nobody knows their names, you know, nobody outside of these organizations mm -hmm. know their names. I said, but I've never seen people who are so just efficient at using violence with only their bodies and improvised tools. Yes. Um, I, I've, I've said this oftentimes, I said, I would, I would put the, you know, if, if the best, you know, quote unquote, knife fighter in the world, you know, civilian, you know, I mean, and what I mean by that non-criminal was in mm -hmm. there and I, I knew he was going to have to go up against one of the individuals that I've been exposed to, but uh, no, hands down. I know one person knows how to kill and yes. um, it, it's a very different thing. And, and that's not glorifying it. It's absolutely humbling for somebody oh. like me to realize oh. that a, an individual, an individual well-trained with intent uh, is far more dangerous than somebody who has trained extensively, but never had to actually, um, being in an environment like that, you know, uh, it's, it's I, a, yeah, it's a, it's a really important distinction that you're making. Um, you know, you just take the corporate aspect by way of example. Um, you have an individual that's a CEO of a corporation and, and uh, you know, he's got uh, 
um, a different, you know, he's got marketing, he's got research, he's got all these uh, elements of his corporation beneath him that he's controlling and he has people in place to facilitate that. Um, and oftentimes people attribute that alpha characteristic uh, to that individual, uh, when in fact, that's not an alpha male. And oftentimes within the predatory um, lifestyle within prison, uh, those aren't alpha males either, but they take on that characteristic. And so it becomes a matter of training. And when you couple that training with intelligence, you know, if you're reading Sun Tzu or um, um, Nietzsche, or, you know, take Nietzsche by way of example, he's a favorite of mine, only because he was a worm of a man. Um, <laughs> intellectually, amazing. But in the practical application of what he was talking about, wasn't happening. Right. You see, and that's the difference. And so that you can train um, all you want. But it's when you get into the real life situation, when you're really under the gun, literally, uh, that it matters um, by way of how you carry out what you're doing. That not only requires uh, education uh, as it relates to philosophy or otherwise, but it requires street education. Um, you know, how do you read a person? Um, you know, I'll tell you how I do. It's body language. And um, so that 75 to 90% of what a person communicates is through their body and understanding that, you know, and there's a saying within the prison system itself, warm smile, cold heart. Um, and, that, and that just simply means that you don't let people see you. And so that you take that type of individual and you remove him to the street where he's had this training and he's educated himself. I mean, when I came to prison, I couldn't read or write. Um, and I learned. I put myself to college. And then uh, you know, one of the first things I understood in reading books was that that was somebody else's knowledge. And I was more interested in, in acquiring my own knowledge. And so that comes into the idea of uh, self-mastery or self-efficacy, if you will. And, um, you know, that becomes important, knowing who you are, what you're capable of in any given situation. Um, you know, the ability to put somebody to sleep is what it's called. Um, and you do that by way of personality, you, you know, it becomes an act. Uh, and, and you see uh, that. some amazingly charismatic individuals. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. that, that, yes. that I've met who are just Cold. Mm -hmm. Well, you even you said it in the Nat Geo uh, mm -hmm. thing. You said you were talking about two of the individuals. Go, hey, great guys, awesome, but you know, killers, and they wouldn't yeah. think twice about you know doing this. That's that right. thing. I found yeah. it to be very consistent. It's not like again, and when I'm trying to tell civilians, this is actually very helpful right now. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times people come to me after surviving an act of violence, mm -hmm. and they knew something was wrong at A. Mm but they let it get all the way to C because they were trying to, they thought they were being, they thought they might've been judgmental towards a person that they, mm -hmm. that it was socially awkward for them to disengage at mm -hmm. that point. And they didn't do it yet. The body was screaming at them that something mm -hmm. was wrong and they don't understand mm -hmm. exactly what you're talking about. You, you know, that idea of the body language, the body communicates a threat to yeah. us. Nonverbals yeah. that we can't pick up, but we pick it up through That's body right. language. And I try to mm -hmm. tell people how to hone that skill and just enjoy mm -hmm. and, and risk embarrassment. Who cares? Yeah. You know, I tell I tell women all the time if, if an unfamiliar male gets into a uh, an elevator and you just don't feel good, get off. Just yes. get off. Don't worry That's about good. the temporary embarrassment or whatever you, that you think right there. Your mm -hmm. body's probably telling you there's something wrong. Yes. And, and any, any and everywhere that you can. I mean, what you want to caution against is posturing. Right. You know, this I, I, what we refer to as posturing. It's the worst thing you can possibly do. You know, in that situation, because you're going to be called on it. And when you're called on it, um, that's when the damage occurs, you know, relative to that. If you read a situation, go with your instinct, go with your gut. And as you say, I don't give a damn if you run away, run away. That's what you do. You know, you don't attempt to engage. You don't posture as if you're, you're all that in a bag of chips because you're not. Right. Um, particularly when you're up against a predator. And that's what we're talking about, our predators who are skilled at preying upon individuals in whatever capacity. And it's just simply a matter of training yourself, literally training yourself to read that, to be aware. 
and what you're dealing with and uh, you know how you're going to assess that and then how you're going to deal with it. And that doesn't mean that you're going to become combative. If you can get away from that situation, by all means, do so. If you can uh, sound an alarm, by all means, do so. Yeah. Um, that's the situation. But if you're in the situation and you know that you can't get away, that you can't sound an alarm, then be prepared to defend yourself as best you can. Well, because like you said, the worst thing that can happen is that you enter into a situation posturing and you have nothing in the mm -hmm. toolbox. That's right. You, know, you have nothing there because yeah. it's just, it's going to go horribly wrong for you. And that, that I mean, even capitulating at times, mm -hmm. you know, is more preferable than posturing. Yes. Because sometimes, you know, that, that works. I mean, I think you, you've talked about how individuals would recognize a situation, immediately capitulate mm -hmm. um, to the situation and the, pro the predator, the alpha at that point, okay, you're useful to me now. Now I don't have to, we don't have to deal with this anymore. Now I'm going to use right. you for what you're, 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 you're capable for. Whereas yes. posturing is there's, there's no, there's no good outcome even. And the worst thing that can no. happen is if you get away with posturing, because then you're yeah, going to use it, it again. And yeah. it's, it's just tragic. Yeah. Another way of saying posturing is bluffing. Yes. You see, and you're going to get your bluffs going to be called. Yeah. That's the thing you see, because the individual that you're encountering is doing so with purpose and so if the challenge comes he's prepared to meet that challenge right whatever it may be uh and, and if you're posturing then you put yourself in an extraordinary disadvantage because what you've done is you've heightened the potential of that violent individual through that posturing he now sees you as uh, as a greater threat threat than he previously did and so his approach to you is going to be tenfold what it would have been had you not postured right right and then that goes to the fact that uh, we we were talking in our in our last conversation mm -hmm. um when people uh people will look at somebody like me and they say okay you're a big guy tattoos all this other stuff wow you're you know nobody must bother you and i said no i said any anybody that's intimidated by my size my look or anything like that is not my threat it's not the person i'm worried about that's right you know and they don't understand who those individuals are and and in the military world there are guys, i tell people all the time the most dangerous individuals i know in that world are anywhere from five six to five nine anywhere from 145 to maybe 170 pounds nondescript they can get in anywhere and if i saw a couple of those units going in you know, rolling in with their bags real quick kind of nondescript i'd get the hell out of there right away because you know something's about to happen and yep. i found that you know we, we had a situation in san diego years ago where uh bouncer really good guy you know uh, he bounced a biker bar my brother worked at and um he was closing time and he went around and there's a guy quietly just having a beer at there um mike was a big dude about six eight about 300 pounds uh very skilled at what he did um told the individual hey you finish up the guy said okay yeah i'm just gonna finish mike turns his back it's just a bad night for him you know, normally he was better at this he's actually very good with people but mm -hmm. you know when he had, he had a bad night tells the guy tells somebody else hey get out looks back and the guy's still there drinking beer the guy's about 140 pounds probably about like you know five six mike goes and he pushes him i don't think he meant to do it but he pushed him in the chest the guy goes over in the bar slant you know slaps out in the floor mike steps over him all of a sudden you've got this 280 pound guy six eight on top of you this guy I remember we looked he uh, to us it looked like he just stepped up and he stepped up and he was inside of Mike's leg. And then he just walked right out the door and Mike had dropped. He had cut his Achilles and then came right up and just inside and tried to get the femoral. He nicked it. Luckily, he didn't cut it any deeper, but it was enough to mm. drop Mike really mm -hmm. quickly. But it was very smooth. You could tell this individual was, was very, he never got caught, um, but it was so unnecessary. You know, mm -hmm. that guy was not looking for, I'm not, listen, you never know who you're dealing with, but this was not the first time this individual did something like this. They were very skilled at what they did. And again, yeah. the rest, the people viewing had no idea what was happening. Yeah. It happens. It just happened so smoothly and, and fast. And this guy mm -hmm. was so calm about it. He didn't, yeah. there was no thing. So it, that's, I, I think that's why, you know, I, I encourage people that, once you're outside your social circles, you have mm -hmm. no idea who you're going to be running into and how are you going to interact true. with those people? And why would you provoke anything unnecessarily? And, you know, 
the, the one thing that I, I've, I've always found, uh, I had a very good friend who unfortunately died last year. He's a very well-known fitness mm -hmm. trainer named Charles Polican. Mm -hmm. And he, Charles would train all around the world. And we, he and I had a discussion when I did my last book. And he said to me, he goes, you know, Tim, it was just funny you're saying, we were just kind of talking about the idea that one in, in, a, in a fitness gym, in a gym, we hate to go to the popular gyms where all the, the, the beautiful people go. Mm -hmm. um, the best gyms for us where people were the most polite were actually gyms where most of the ex-felons would, would, would work out. And he would actively okay. see, he'd call, he'd talk to the cops because he trained a lot of cops. He'd go, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to do a seminar in your town. Where do all the ex-felons work out? Where do they go? And he'd con consistently go there because everybody understood protocol and you mm -hmm. didn't just take another guy's weights. You didn't walk mm -hmm. in front of him. You didn't, everybody was very respectful not mm -hmm. in a intimidating way. It was just understood oh. that, that, that it's just mm -hmm. a polite society, oh. politeness, because they knew the underlying threat. Mm -hmm. If, if you violated those things, it's just, it's just interesting. Well, it's a, it's a given. Yeah. It's a given actually, you know, going to the size characteristic, uh, just by way of example, um, I would much rather fight a bear than a Wolverine. Yeah. Um, you know, that's the best analogy I think I can give when I'm dealing with somebody with size. Um, it creates, enormous opportunities right you know relative to dealing with that individual with a smaller individual wiry uh fast speed i mean it changes the whole dynamic and you're actually being a large man at a disadvantage yeah because he's going to move inside of you you know see he has uh, far more strike points than you do you know because of that inside characteristic you know you've got you've got to reduce um the scope of your moves right naturally whereas you might use a hand now you've got to use an elbow you know relative to that you've got to use your head literally right uh, you, know, you know in that so that smaller man has the advantage yeah uh, you think the big man does he doesn't no it's absolutely that's that's absolutely and yeah i have you got to reduce your, your thing and the other thing too that if you're if you're a bigger guy and more developed you, it's easier to see what they they you're, you're just a target oh, yeah. chart for them, you know? Absolutely. That, that yeah. there. So it's yeah. interesting. I weighed, I weighed 310 pounds and I was pushing 620 on a bench. Had this big old huge chest and these big old arms and I couldn't do a damn thing with them. Right. And, and the thing is, is that you, you've got that big chest and this big arm, you have to swing around it. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't come inside of anything. Right. Um, and so it makes a difference. I mean, it, it's it, all that, as far as I'm concerned, means nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. It's, it, yeah, I, I've told people that, you know, multiple times ago, a lot of times, actually, it's a hindrance to me being effective. Yes. Um, if, if I need and I realized that like, even like recently, I started doing um, upgrading my, um, I, I decided to, to upgrade my combat shooting. And I realized mm -hmm. like my bulk kind of got in the way I got I worked out at a place where there are a bunch of young NFL kids and like an idiot, I try to keep up with them. And um, <laughs> it's fun as hell. But I, you know, yeah. I put on mass pretty easy. And it mm -hmm. actually took away from my skill set. And I had to, yeah. uh, I had to redo it. Y yeah. You said something else that I want people to understand, because there's this understanding that there are people out there, there are a lot of people that give advice that say, Oh, there's nothing you can do when there's multiple attackers, you're screwed, you're this. Mm -hmm. and, and you, you were talking about a situation that I've tried to convey to people. I don't just don't understand. I found in the few situations that I've had to deal with it, more people is actually in some ways, if you understand movement and you understand how, how to, how to go, it's actually easy. They, they get in each other's way. And it, it's actually a hint, you know, very few groups know how to work together in, in, yes. in a violent situation like that. Could you speak mm -hmm. to, multiple attackers and what you found. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I can, particularly within a controlled environment. I've, I've been confront, confronted by multiple assailants. And um, what you find is, is that um, there's usually when there are multiple assailants, only one person that's actually serious. So it, it, again, that goes back to your training, being able to identify via body language, uh, who the real threat is. But more times than not, my experience has been that they get in each other's way uh and really um it's about i consider it a dance you know most people don't know how to dance uh, but um it's a matter of moving and continually moving and using that person's energy against them you know within the native community we have grappling people don't often consider that your your natives are excellent fighters 
um, but it's not necessarily striking, it's grappling. And so the analogy to that would be judo or aikido, right. uh, insofar as using a person's energy against them relative to that. So that with a large group, uh, I would rather fart, fight a large group as opposed to one individual. Um, that's because you can use their energy uh, against them. They get in each other's way, um, particularly if they don't know what they're doing. Um, they think just by sheer number that they're going to overwhelm you. Uh, that's not necessarily the case. Um, and it's simply a matter of um, eye-hand coordination and what I refer to as a dance. Um, most, most people don't know how to pivot, um, regardless of the style of fighting that, that you're talking about. I see it all the time. Uh, it amazes me. Um, but, uh, and, then, and really that's not a criticism. And it isn't meant to be a criticism. It, it's just simply pointing out the obvious. I but found, I found the this. easiest people to train in, in my world are former gymnasts or dancers. Mm -hmm. um, they mm -hmm. understand yes. movement. They're in there to the fact where my, my child, I have three small children right now. They're mm -hmm. all doing gymnastics. They're all doing, they have a very good grappling uh, coach that they're also working mm -hmm. with there because mm -hmm. I want them, especially my girls. I want, I want my girls to get used to being grabbed and not yeah. you know, understanding what that is. It's mm -hmm. just the reality, you know, I, yeah. and unfortunately, women violence against women is happening at every younger ages and so yes. we've just made that commitment but i've found that the idea uh, the one thing that's really not as well understood and it was interesting to hear you talk about that in our last conversation mm -hmm. the idea of dance and movement um and people misinterpret what that means i think it's just yes. i think it's a knowledge of your body and well, being able to understand how to move correctly and, and in a way that's effective versus working against yourself yeah, Tim, it's rhythm is really what you're talking about. My wife is four foot 10 and weighs uh, 100 pounds soaking wet, if that. Um, and I don't teach her to strike. I don't teach her to kick. I teach her to grapple, right. you see, because that's going to be her only advantage to move inside and to use that person's energy against them, you know, as it relates to that. Um, but when we're talking about dancing, when I'm talking about dancing, I'm talking about rhythm. Um, and most people... I think misunderstand what that means. You know, you can go back to the origins of, uh, you know, Paleolithic um, man and uh, the idea of where linguistics come from associated with rhythm itself. Um, and so that we have that um, instinctually in all of us, but it's, it's a matter of one, keeping your wits about you because we're, we all have to deal with this human beings that fight, flight, freeze syndrome, you know, the, um, the uh, access associated with, you know, the um, hypothalamus and in, in, in the, the uh, pituitary and the adrenal glands, that access as it relates to the limbic system, you know, the biochemistry. Right. And uh, it's, being, it's being aware of that. And that actually impacts an individual's rhythm as it relates to that. Because if you're confronted with a situation and you freeze, then you're obviously not going to have rhythm. But even in flight or fight, rhythm becomes critical uh, and it's a matter of understanding that rhythm um, it's not it's not necessarily even coordination you see but it's being aware of, of where you are in the moment relative to what's happening and just a simple move of the shoulder simple move of the head to slip a punch you see or to deflect a blow whatever it is it's just a dance that's all it is and uh, people put too much, by my, by my estimation, people put too much ha-ha, what my older used to call ha-ha, um, on it. Um, and uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a matter of, I think you said it a moment ago about body awareness. Yeah. And it's the relationship between the body and the brain. Uh, too often people think that the brain controls the body. It doesn't. The body controls the brain. We now know that. Right. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. So that if you have an awareness of your body, um, what happens with the brain becomes second nature in relationship to the body and its movements. And um, it need not be choreographed. Um, I see a lot of people doing that, you know, going through these various blocks and moves and strikes and kicks. And it's okay to familiarize yourself with that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, um, you can be in a situation where um, none of that matters. None of it. 
Um, you but, know, I, I read an article, in, it really stuck with me. Um, I believe it was like 1989, I read it. It was in San Diego Reader, and it was about a turn of the century San Diego cop. And he was really interesting, he was a good boxer growing, you know, growing up and everything. And back then it was days where literally, you know, I, I, I forgot it's right after world war one, when he started mm. and the, the, his training was the, the, his, the Sergeant comes out and he says, Hey son, you know, right from wrong. He goes, yeah. He goes, hands my gun, hands my badge. He goes, go out there and do good. And he gets out there Well, he's, he's dealing in the streets with all these, you know, different, different individuals. And he said a really interesting thing. He said, he had to stop training in boxing because it mm -hmm. threw off his timing in the street. Mm -hmm. And he noticed he would, he would get into a situation and then he'd do something from boxing that mm -hmm. actually stopped his flow. Yes. And, you know, and back then, obviously they were a lot more hands-on. They did a lot more, you know, he talks more about that, but I thought that was really interesting because I've, I've found the same thing with a lot of people that they come in and they, they realize they end up doing something in a true violent situation. Mm -hmm. Not a competition, but in a true right. violent situation where they're doing something formatic that works with the sport, but is actually mm -hmm. very detrimental when your life's on the line. Yes, I, I agree with you. I mean, take boxing as an example. Now, my elder taught me a number of different disciplines, styles, but the thing that he emphasized was that I, was that I make it my own right. so that, well, my style of fighting was different prior to going to prison. I actually had to make that adjustment. Uh, in prison um, to what I refer to as open-handed combat. Um, and that's, you know, any strikes that do occur are open-handed as opposed to a closed fist and that strike there because it can be debilitating relative to the type of situation that you're in. So that, you know, to take an individual's arm, for instance, and just use that momentum with them and a simple slap up alongside the head can be devastating, you know, to that individual or uh, the heel of your hand strike, you know, to the throat or up underneath the chin or to the nose or to the eye socket or to the side of the head, open-handed, yes. you know, not closed-fisted. And um, that's an adaptation that I made to prison, you know, relative to that. And, uh, you know, I didn't uh, initiate kicks. I was taught to kick, but I, I never initiated him um, in any of the fighting that I did in prison, simply because they didn't work. Right. Um, in that, in that, you know, close quarter characteristic, you get into um, um, grappling, and that has real value, because uh, you're using that person's energy against them, you're using their body weight against them, and you're using yours in conjunction with them. It's just like a dance again, is really what it comes down to. But, you know, <clears throat> one size doesn't fit all. And so that whatever you're learning, um, you want to make it your own. Uh, in keeping with your body structure, um, you know, your mindset relative to your body structure, that relationship between your body and your mind, and how you incorporate that to any defensive posture. And I would advocate that uh, right off the top, that whatever posture you take, that it be defensive as opposed to offensive. Um, it isn't to say that there isn't a time to take the offense. Right. There isn't a martial art in the world that doesn't teach that. But most martial arts are based on a defensive posture. And uh, that's simply utilizing whatever your opponent is bringing to you against them. You find um, there's, uh, there are times when you just don't have choice in a, in a matter. Like, like people mm -hmm. say, that a given in the civilian world is, oh, if you find yourself up against somebody with a knife and mm -hmm. uh, you don't have a tool, you know, any way, shape, form. You know, you just gotta, you, you, you've got to run. You're, there's no way you can survive. You know, against somebody with a knife. I, I know right. that's not true. Meaning, mm -hmm. I, I know people that have had, they've had, mm -hmm. they've been in that situation. Not an optimal situation. Don't get me wrong, but no. you devoid a choice. And just because the other person has a has a tool doesn't mean that you you have the luxury of just what are you gonna do, capitulate, stop, or anything like that. Can you just? I, and the reason I'm asking you this question, Mike, is because I know there have been you know, situations in prison where people have had to face somebody with a weapon when they didn't have it. And yeah. that I just think this one size fits all these, these, these platitudes that people talk about are mm -hmm. ridiculous. And I think to limit your, to limit yourself in any way, shape or form to think, well, I, there's nothing I can do. I'm screwed. That's true. You know, if you, if you really mm -hmm. believe that, then it's there, but I, right. I you know, I, I just think, I think that's a, a very dangerous 
assumption to make that that you're completely powerless to deal against somebody yeah. as a tool. I would agree with you. I mean, I've been in perhaps one of the more extreme situations um, where an attempt was made on my life uh, with an individual who had a weapon and he, and unfortunately, I'd let him get behind me and I won't go into the whole story other than to, to, to tell you what happened in that he did, did a roundhouse kick. I was sitting on a bench, took me head over heels. I went semi-unconscious and he had a box cutter. So I went, um, I'd lost my sight, but I could still hear him. So I was able to block his attempts to cut my throat, he cut my ear in half. It had to be sewn back on. And he caught the, um, um, the anterior artery at the rear here. He missed it by one millimeter. Wow. But that was only because I had blocked it um, because I could hear him. But when I got my sight back, I took the weapon away from him. Um, and in the point in telling you that story is that no matter the situation, what's key, and if, if an individual is going to train, uh, emphasis needs to be needs to be placed on awareness of what's occurring while it's occurring. That's that fight, flight, freeze characteristic again, and the conditioning associated with that. And it's important um, because that when you're dealing with an individual with a weapon, uh, you can actually disarm that individual, um, or uh, you can reduce the damage to yourself by maintaining that awareness. One, what most people do with an individual with a knife is they step away. I step in. Thank you. You see? Yes. You don't, you don't step away. You step in. Uh, Mike, and, everybody um, I know that's actually had to survive that, that's the, they realize everything mm -hmm. that makes a difference is forward, not, mm -hmm. and, and giving that's distance right. actually helps them. At that yes. Point. One, it, 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 the person that's the knife wielder, it, it takes them off balance. It's the last thing they expect right. um, because they're using that weapon um, uh, as a means to either kill you or subdue you or control you in some capacity. And the last thing they expect is you to step into that. See, and that is actually a defensive posture. It's not an aggressive posture, but in doing that, it gives you the ability to one, take hold of that arm that has the weapon and use your body weight, just simply take that and turn your body weight into that person. So now you have the knife out in front of you. And it's a very simple uh, procedure. But it's that idea of stepping in, whatever you use, taking your head. Um, there's an old technique with natives in bear fighting, you know, that uh, many natives back in the day, one of the rites of passage was to go out and fight a bear. And so that when you study how a bear fights, which I have when I was a youngster, uh, you understand that they, they don't use this thing of a, a bear swiping at you. So you think of an individual with a knife in the same capacity swiping at you. Bear doesn't do that. What it does is they grab hold of each other and they disembowel with their hind feet. And so that when you fight a bear and you have a knife in that capacity, one of the first things you do is you step into that bear when it comes up on its hind feet. You take the top of your head and you stick it up underneath its jaw here and you pull yourself in and then you do your work from inside because all that bear is going to do is hug you. And what you do is you stay away from the hind feet relative to that disembowelment because that's how they fight. Well, it's the same with a human attacker. When you step in, you see, as opposed to step away. So you have the opportunity either to take the hand that has the weapon, use both hands. Don't just use one hand, particularly if you're a woman. Use both hands and grab a hold of that arm and turn yourself into that individual. You see, and use all your strength to hold that knife out in front of you. You bite, you kick, you scratch, you do whatever's necessary, you see, in that capacity. There's a lot more to that, of course, but I'll leave that to your to your training, Tim. Well, that that's great. I, I want to shift now, Mike. We, first of all, thank you. But listen, you've accomplished as far as what I wanted people to hear when it comes to training and mm -hmm. and posturing and everything is there. Mm -hmm. Now I want to transfer into your 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 work now, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure everybody understands. Mike did a total of forty five years in prison. Yes, that your gang related stuff was really just a, like a third of that right for the most part yes. we're right around there so you actually less than that but yeah it was a very yeah, short but, but it's I, I want to make that very clear to people i mean a huge mm -hmm. rise a huge you know mm -hmm. level i mean you came very prominent but the majority of your time was after you know after this and yeah. you uh you, you started you started working towards helping people that are in prison and, yes. and helping guys in, in there and 
I guess what my concern is that I'm seeing, and and I'd like you to talk to the, the fact of the young prisoners coming in now and the level of violence. And, you know, back in the set, I get it. You know, my grandfather grew up, he was a, he, he was depression era. Um, mm. guy, there was a code, even on the street, even street fighters back right. then, even when it got nasty and stuff, there was still mm-hmm. kind of this code yes. about what you did and didn't do. That seems to have all kind of gone away. I, and I think it, what's important is people have to understand that especially now they're seeing it they're seeing it right now with covid and everything yeah people are going to be released back into society and Mm -hmm. if we just release and we don't try to engage and change things and and recognize you know uh that a lot of these individuals have never had any sort of formal education nor education how on how to how to behave in society and not only that, I think there's a dearth of them that have never had a positive male figure in their life, let alone a father. Mm-hmm. And yes. can you talk to the ramifications of that, um, where you see things right now? And, and your wife and you are putting together just a, you know, a great program that mm-hmm. I want people to be aware of, and they will be aware of it you know, at the end of this mm-hmm. interview. Um, and I'm going to preface it by saying this. I... I think when I started looking into this, actually, after I read that article, you know, in 2004, Mm -hmm. I think it was, um, Mm -hmm. I not only started engaging on the law enforcement side of corrections and learning about the gangs that way. I also started to take part in some groups that uh, actually went to the prisons and were doing work. A lot of them are entrepreneurial groups. They sit there Mm -hmm. and they they engage groups as, uh, you know, these prisoners that are going to be getting out. And um, you, you hear about this. And what was interesting was it was a humbling experience realizing that you could, you would, you would get with these guys and you'd realize, Hey, I was maybe one or two bad decisions away from being on the other mm. side of this. Yeah. Um, and many of us are that way. Many of us can sit there and realize that, you, you know, you could be there. So therefore, how do you, how do you see, First of all, what what are what are people dealing with like, like like with the kids that are coming in now? And when I say kids, I don't mean in a detrimental way. I just mean they're, they're young. They're young guys. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems it seems like it's far more. And it's what some older uh, some of the older prisoners have told me that they're saying, "Hey, these guys coming in, they're they're way different than we were. They're yes. they're much more prone to go zero to kill violence. They, the the morality isn't." you know, mm-hmm. code or morality really is not there. It's all about power and it's all mm-hmm. about domination um, yeah. and, and how that's going to affect us on the streets and everything. Yeah, it's, it's a real concern. I mean, one of the things that, uh, that we deal with, our organization is called Live, Learn and Prosper. And it's uh, an organization that my wife and I started while I was still in prison. And the idea, the concept behind it is self-help. Um, it takes a holistic approach and, uh, you know, we're now out into the communities at large. It's not just dealing with prisoners anymore, but it's, it's dealing with society in general, with this um, approach to uh, healing from trauma and, um, you know, developing a code, understanding what your belief system is, why that is your belief system. But the thing that um, is really important to me is dealing with these at, at-risk youth, those that haven't been incarcerated, that, you know, Um, I dealt with a group from 10 to 16, and it's the way in which you approach them. While I was in prison, they would come into prison, and uh, the authorities had the idea that it was going to be like this scared straight, and I don't believe in that. I don't think it has any value whatsoever. Um, I think what these children need is the the opportunity to communicate, to understand that they're loved, um, and why they're loved. And so that uh, when they would bring them into me, you know, they would come in, they bring the teachers. And these are, when I say at-risk youth, you know, these are kids that disrespect their parents and disrespect their teachers. And it's a part of adolescence, really, if you stop and think about it, that undeveloped brain and the um, peer association that they may have at that time. So it's a matter of, of giving them a strong role model relative to um, their code, their belief system. Um, but when they would come in and I had, I would have like 25 kids and the teachers and the parents and the counselors would all be in the background. And the anticipation was, was that I would tell these children that, you know, they're on the wrong road here and this is what they they're looking forward to. 
And again, I do not believe in that. Instead, what I told them is that I was told by their counselors and their teachers and their parents that the reason they were here was because each and every one of them had the potential to be a leader and that they were here to learn leadership skills as it relates to that. And it had just an, an enormous impact on these children. I, I'll never forget it. Um, and so it's that idea as opposed to a negative, a positive, and instilling in them, you know, the idea that of self-confidence and self-esteem and leadership and working together and where that comes from. These are all important factors and they may not have, you know, that available to them either because they're only have one parent in the home and that parent works two jobs. And so, you know, these are um, kids that are essentially on their own, whatever it may be. But even in the prison system itself, you know, when we started the group, we had a, a population on the yard of 600 prisoners. We had 15 groups with 25 prisoners in each group. And these are prisoners that came of their own volition, former gang members, addicts, you name it. I even had a group for the nerds. And, um, but it was the approach, this holistic, this biopsychosocial spiritual approach, understanding, um, you know, what's going on with them uh, biologically. Uh, you know, the idea of epigenetics, the, the environment's impact upon that individual insofar as, uh, um, you know, genetic selection during the course of cellular regeneration, how that can change uh, a person's thinking. Um, you know, this is all science. Uh, I'm a biologist by, biologist by training, but, you know, a lot of the more um, important stories come from my wife's work on death row uh, with death row prisoners. And... Um, you know, bringing about the release of some of those prisoners who were wrongly convicted. Um, and then, you know, interviewing their families and, you know, understanding the relationship between family and those individuals and, you know, actually what went wrong to brought that person to even be accused in the first place. I've been there myself. Um, so it's a matter of educating. And uh, we do that not only with prisoners, but we do that with, with just people in general who have an interest, you know, in that. Uh, I work with... Um, the policymakers at The Hague over in the Netherlands relative to their jihad unit. And, um, you know, I don't want to put a lot on that. As my elder would say, don't put a lot of haha on it. But, you know, the issue there was the younger individuals who were associated with the jihad elders and the influence that they had upon them relative to what they were doing and how they were doing it. And so I worked with them and so far as to how to approach those youngsters, you know, relative to coming into their own their own rites of passage, their own understanding of themselves. You know, and we have that right here in this country right now with all these hate groups. Yeah. There's an enormous opportunity, you know, and oftentimes people don't want to hear it, but the foundation of what we do is a foundation of love. Um, and there just isn't enough of that going around. Um, and, and people don't understand, you're not talking about some altruistic idea it's a very practical idea it is yeah. it's it's the reason yeah. that we're, we're you know the one thing my wife uh is uh, you know as people know there she's in law enforcement and, and mm -hmm. you know they they understood and they're doing they're very progressive out in, in las vegas and they're they're doing mm -hmm. some really good work in the prisons believe it or not engaging because they know these guys yes. are back on the street teaching parroting skills yoga yes, stuff like that yes. and it was derided it was derided at first and yet what they saw was they saw wow this is making a real difference in fact these the, the prisoners had to earn their way into these programs and the behavior yes. modifications were huge and and listen nobody has nobody has unrealistic expectations but quite frankly these people are coming back on the streets whether we do anything or not and if we yes. can change hey you only change one one out of 20 that's one yes. person that we don't it's not a recidivist that doesn't end up going back in can become productive yes. Mm -hmm. and not predatory on the society you yes. go back it's, it's worth the effort because it's much cheaper you know it, there's there's three stages that you're talking about you're talking and my wife agrees absolutely with this the if you can get the kids before they get incarcerated if you can get them prior yes. to that that's your, that's your primary you know if you can it save is. that that's great mm -hmm. once they're in and they're in there they're, they're still there and then the guys that have really done their time, they're coming in and they're going to come back out now and re, re, you know, reorient into society. Those are your three stages that, that they kind of outlined for me. I, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm sure you have more, you know, intricacy in that, but for the general population, what I'm trying to tell everybody is we, we're going to, we're going to pay the price either way. And, and, yes. and to put things into programming, if you sit there and deride the idea that, 
um, a lot of these kids, especially the male kids are growing up in an environment where they're, they don't have a mission, they don't have anything, they don't have anything bigger than themselves to, to look at, they're not mm -hmm. given anything inspiring. And so who's going to fill that void? Well, these gangs do, yeah. they do a very good job of recruiting, yes. giving you a message, giving you a family, giving you uh, mm -hmm. a role to where you feel feel part of it. And if we don't provide something else, another alternative to that, you know, this cycle is going to just continue. Well, I, I have, uh, as you know, I have a lot of haters, um, detractors that that oppose what I do for that very reason, because they're in the business of pulling these youngsters in and, um, you know, making them feel as if they're a part of a family, that they're loved and they're this and that, and, and they're none of that. They're completely expendable and they're used up and they're tossed away. And it's so the issue here is to deal with these children on, on a, a basis of first and foremost, oftentimes trauma. Um, and that trauma comes in many, many forms, but it's getting them to understand the origins of that trauma and then deal with that. And, you know, again, we're talking brain chemistry here. And so far as the, you know, epigenetics and the generation of new dendrites and, you know, the fragmented memories associated with trauma. And we, and we do all that, um, but particularly where kids are concerned. And so, you know, those detractors that I do have, it, I don't compete with them. Uh, I'm not interested in competing with them. You see, I stand for something, and that, that's what this is about. I don't stand against them. You know, whatever they're doing, that's their problem. But I, I take the opportunity, and it's what I call the opportunity bias, that we have a, a negative situation here, and we have the opportunity um, to add something positive and constructive. Uh, by way of teaching and educating and, uh, you know, in the, again, that fourfold way, it's important. Um, most people don't get that. You know, most, I'm a firm believer that all young people should go some, through some kind of, of rite of passage um, because it gives them a sense of identity. And if our children today are suffering from any, anything, it's an identity crisis. Um, you know, and you can even say that about adults when you look at these hate groups. You know, there's, there's an identity crisis there. You know, um, um, my wife recently wrote a piece called, uh, you know, haters need to hate and the psychology associated with that. And it's very, very unfortunate. You know, we're writing a book right now called uh, The Winter Warrior. And it's really the very process that I'm talking about that all of us come through relative to arriving at that sense of who we are, our identity. And, uh, you know, why we, we have the identity that we do. Um, and so all these things, you know, and I should probably also mention to him is that one of the requirements that we have, whether the person is on the streets or they're in prison, is that they come to what we do of their own volition. Um, and by that, I simply mean that's their choice, because we're a firm believer that there are no answers, only choices. Right. And, um, and so that's what we advocate relative to that. Um, you know, um, I'll go down into the depths of Los Angeles, Skid Row. And, and, and deal with people there. Um, and, you know, the youth there, there are a lot of people doing great work. We're not, we're not alone in that, believe me. Um, so it's a matter of communicating. And communication is a key here. You know, relationship is a key here. But I, I will emphasize once again, that at the root of all that we do is love. Um, it's not spoken about enough. It's not addressed enough. It's not acknowledged enough. It's as if, you know, our society has placed some kind of taboo uh, upon the, the idea of what love means in relationship as a society within our community, you know, as it relates to our children amongst each other, you know, and when you couple with that, the idea of intimacy and what in intimacy means in relationship to each other, you know, the diversity associated with that. I mean, my one of the first lessons from my elder was the very idea that Everything we need to know is provided for us in nature, every example. And the first example we see in nature as it relates to any ecology is diversity. So we encourage diversity. You know, that, again, that idea that one size doesn't fit all, but we're, we're a very diverse uh, group of human beings and we're all one people. You know, we have different ethnicities and we encourage people to, to um, explore you know, the, the, the culture associated with their ethnic, ethnicity. Uh, it, they're very, very rich. You see this melting pot idea. Uh, I don't know where that came from, 
Uh, I don't care where it came from, uh, but I'm an advocate of, of um, you know, learning about your culture and learning about how diverse uh, we are as a people and what that means uh, as we come together and share with each other and communicate with each other and engage in relationship with each other. Uh, that's, that's absolutely huge. And I, I hope I, I'm going to encourage everybody to, um, you know, to, to not only check your organization out, you know, mm. donate to it and, and do it and be very supportive. I know, Mike, this is going to be one of, you know, many conversations I hope to have with you. There's other subjects I could cover. I'm sure, I'm sure the audience yes. is going to give me a, a ton of info. I can't tell you how much I, I appreciate your time. Um, I, I, you were somebody that, uh, I, as I've said this to everybody, your detractors, it's interesting what your detractors say, because it's, to me, it, the one thing they cannot say is you have been absolutely consistent for the last 20, I got 20 years of interviews and mm -hmm. documentation on you and you're consistent all the way through. And that's why I wanted to have this conversation because you, you're a, as far as I see, you were somebody that was put into a situation where you had to make a choice. And from what I try to tell people all the time is um, when you have to deal in an environment that's going to be inherently violent and, and controlled through, you know, the successful use of violence, it's easy for you to make choices when you don't have to what you know, say what you would do. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think what's really interesting is, is you were in there, you didn't come from a criminal background. And mm -hmm. you were thrust into it. And you had to make a choice. And I'm surprised you own it. That's the other thing you don't run from mm -hmm. any of it. Um, right. and, and I know there are going to be people that are going to be, you know, you know, why are you, you know, why are you talking to somebody like this? And well, I'll tell you why, because there's, there's so much good information here if you just are open to it. And yes. I appreciate the way you put it out. You put it out in a very clear and understand, uh, understandable way Thank for you. people, not intimidating. I mean, you're, you, I think probably people will be more intimidated by the fact of just how antiseptic and how clean you are in your conversation mm -hmm. about this. And I found the people that, the more people that uh, truly have real experience across the board, you know, this is how they talk. They don't, they, they never want to experience it again right. if they don't have to, yes. but they understand what it takes to, to utilize the tool. Mm -hmm. It's so, not about being boastful. And, and I, I would never want to give the impression that I'm glorifying. I think you stated that earlier about uh, your, your own discussion. I, I don't ever want to give the impression that I'm glorifying violence, but violence is a part of our society. And there's a time and place for it. Right. And that needs to be understood. Um, but as it relates to um, questions, should anybody have any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to do my best if I can to answer them. Uh, I would encourage that because what we're talking about here is dialogue, communication. Right. And, you know, there was a time when um, I thought competition was the um, end all of everything. But what I've come to learn, uh, primarily as a result of the guidance of my wife, uh, is cooperation is far more important. And that's a large order, but that's what I'm advocating and that's what I'm seeking is cooperation. I'm not interested, like I said, in standing against anybody. Um, you know, I understand that people do what they do for the reasons that they do it. Those people that are still in the mix, you know, um, they're attempting uh, to keep other people in the mix. They, they, want, they want to continue their lifestyle and, and by all means do so, you see. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to advocate uh, for the things that I believe in. And um, so I would encourage your listeners, if, the, that if they have questions, uh, please ask. And I agree with you. I look forward to uh, future conversations. And if they have an idea for what those conversations should be about, please let us know. That'd be great. Well, Mike, thanks so much for your time. Um, and uh, we will be in touch soon. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate it. All right. Okay. I'll just, I'll just let this, uh, this, this run. It's still, it's still. Okay. So that, is my conversation with Mike. Uh, I, there was just so much to unpack in that last one that I, I just, I, I really hope you you got that. There are a lot of just, just really essential information from somebody who had to use violence as a survival tool in truly an area that very few of us will ever experience. You know, um, it's funny, you know, when I, when I look at 
things like the talent code and places that take, teach you like deep practice and how to learn. A lot of it is you put yourself in these intense situations and then you're able to, when you get in the real world, you have, you know, this, this ability to react in a different way. So I think what people need to understand and what they need to get from this is the fact that things are not always the way we want them to be. You know, I, it would be nice if, you know, a lot of the fallacies that are out there about self-defense worked. It would be nice if people said, hey, there's nothing to do when there's multiple attackers. But as I said, there's just a lot of great information that's out there. There's just, if you're open to it, and it comes from some really tough parts of the world and tough parts of society. So again, I hope you found this useful. Uh, I figure this is probably one of many conversations I'm going to have with Mike. And um, we went on, there's a lot of other issues we could discuss and go way more in depth. But I wanted to give you this introduction um, to this. I know I've talked a lot about, you know, what I've learned in the prison system by studying this and interacting with uh, the corrections facilities. But I hope you got the last part of it too, about, you know, the recidivism and the fact that we as a society have to deal with the fact that we've got a lot of people, especially now, a lot of people being released back into society with no training whatsoever, with no preparation to reintegrate. And organizations like Mike's are out there working with people, helping them make those changes. So please check out liveleadandprosper.org. Um, there's a donation button there. I'd highly encourage people to donate. It doesn't have to be a lot, but it does make a difference. You know, I'm, I'm involved with a couple of different projects. I am going to definitely donate to this project, but, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to arrest ourselves out of the situation. We're not going to be able to keep people locked up forever. It's just not going to happen. And, uh, as you can see, if we release people like this into the system again, you want them to have a different view. You want them to come out with different skill sets. I, I hope you found this useful. I look forward to your comments and uh, thanks for the time.